Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor and I'm a Sony Imaging Ambassador. Now I'm really excited to be reviewing Sony's three new wide angle lenses. This is primarily because we haven't seen a lot of movement in their APS-C sector for what is going on three years now. So it's quite exciting to see Sony focusing their attention back on this important part of the uh, imaging market. So without much further ado, let's take a closer look at these three new lenses. The last two APS-C lenses that we saw Sony release were back in 2019. These were the two zoom lenses with their G branding. Now these are impressive lenses, but we haven't seen any other lenses appear after this date. In fact, we'd have to go back a really long way to find prime lenses released into their APS-C lens lineup. Now this is the last one that I could find that uh, dates back to June 11, 2010, a little pancake lens they'd released. So Sony have been releasing some very high quality full frame lenses since this date. And so um, prime lenses for their APS-C system are well overdue. Now this of course uh, presents the chicken and egg syndrome. I know a lot of people will look at these three new APS-C lenses and say, but where are the new APS-C cameras? And of course, if they release their cameras first, people would say, but there aren't enough lenses for their APS-C system. Ideally, we would have seen both at the same time but of course Sony have released their three lenses first. I would hope that there is a new APS-C camera in development and so just in case Sony in Japan are watching this I would like to put my awesome eight features that I would like to see in a premium APS-C camera and this includes a backlit illuminated sensor we've seen them in the RX cameras and the full frame cameras but the APS-C are using the non backlit illuminated sensors I would like to see a move to the UHS-2 card slot I'd like to see a front dial also the mode dial that we've uh, seen appear on the Alpha 7 IV and I'd also like a move from the USB 2 in out port to a USB-C that's a USB 3.2 I'd like to see three memories there's only two memories on the Alpha 6600 and if that requires removing the scene mode on a premium camera I would take that step I'd also like to see the new cam set feature which allows a user to save all of the camera settings to a file on the memory card. This also allows me to set up other people's cameras from that file copied to their memory card. I'd like to see an option for uncompressed RAW and also 14-bit RAW when shooting with long exposure noise reduction and or bulb mode. I'd also like to see a faster shutter speed moving up from 1 4,000th of a second to 1 8,000th of a second and the reason for this will be become clear when I start reviewing the three um, new lenses. Some people will say, do we really need a new um, a lightweight, uh, small uh, APS-C camera when Sony's compact full frame camera is only six grams heavier than the Alpha 6600? That's a, a fair point, but if I show you the next slide, you'll realize why I think there is still a need for an APS-C system. It is, of course, we can shrink the full frame cameras, but we often can't shrink the full frame lenses beyond a certain point. Now these two lenses have remarkably similar configurations. Yes the 200-600 has a little bit more reach but if we apply the full frame equivalent to that 70-350G to we actually get a 525 millimeter uh, full frame equivalent reach on that APS-C system but look at the weight differences 625 grams compared to over 2 kilograms that's more than three times heavier than that APS-C APS-C lens. Now if we take a look and I've included um, the uh, one of the new three lenses here that's the 1020 power zoom. Now if we uh, include all of those three zoom lenses we have a, a full frame equivalent reach from 15 to 525 millimeters and it comes in at just two kilograms or 4.4 pounds. This of course is the raison d'etre for having an APS-C system as an alternative to full frame. 
Now, if we take a look at um, wide angle APS-C lenses, sometimes the weight saving isn't so significant. If we take a look at these two Zeiss lenses, we have the 2.8 18mm full frame lens on the Alpha 7C there compared to the Zeiss Tuit. Now, this is a 12mm, but if we apply the 1.5 crop factor, that has uh, uh, an angle of view equivalent to that 18mm full frame lens, but we only get a 20% weight saving by choosing that APS-C system. I also need to point out we also get a cost saving as well. Obviously with less glass we, uh, we can actually purchase the APS-C lenses for less money. Now, if we take a look at the um, the, one, the first of Sony's three new uh, wide-angle uh, lenses here, we are looking at the 15mm f1.4. Now, the nearest full-frame equivalent is Sony's FE 20mm f1.8 G. Now, both of these lenses have got very similar specs in that they've got aperture ring, they've got wide apertures, and uh, they've got an AF-MF switch, and we can de-click that aperture ring. But look at the weight saving here we've got we're up against uh, 220 grams uh, compared to 436 grams that's 7.8 ounces compared to 15.4 now Sony have managed to um, uh, create a 50% weight saving by going to APS-C in this and this is really a quite impressive and you'll see this roll out over the other two lenses is yes we have the quality but we also have a significant weight saving even though though they're not telephoto zoom lenses. And if we take a look at this uh, lens in the hand, you can see how diminutive or small it actually appears. Now, the image on the right uh, shows you the form factor in the hand, and I'm very pleased to see Sony putting this lens not on the ZV-E10, but on one of the premium APS-C cameras, because I do believe these lenses will find a market, not just for vloggers or hybrid shooters, but also for people who are wanting to specialize in stills photography. If we take a look at the second new lens, it's the 11mm uh, f1.8. Now this is not a G, but you'll see the quality of the images I've managed to pull off this lens and they're, they're really quite good. Um, and the nearest equivalent in the full frame would be that 14mm f1.8 GM. Now obviously that is a GM lens and so there is going to be quite a, um, a, uh, a weight differential there, but we that's the closest um, full frame lens I could actually find. If we apply the crop factor to that 11 millimeter, we actually get up to more closer to that 16 mil focal length that we would probably achieve on a 1635. But of course, that 11 millimeter is a very small lens at just 181 grams or 6.4 ounces. And if we look at the form factor, I uh, here it is on the ZVE10. Now, this could be used for vlog vloggers or high hybrid shooters who are wanting that very wide angle of view when the camera is at arm's length or just positioned on the table in front of you. So that uh, form factor is really quite impressive with this uh, little 11mm prime lens. And if we compare that to that um, uh, Batis 2.8 full frame 18mm, uh, we can see the uh, weight and size um, advantage of going into that APS-C system there. Now the third lens is the 1020 power zoom. Uh, now uh, we've just had a recent um, 1635 power zoom release, and one of the amazing things about that full frame lens on the right was how small and lightweight it actually was. But look again at the weight saving; we've managed to creep in at just half the weight. Okay, and we've got that um, 15 to uh, 30 mil equivalent full frame equivalent zoom on this power zoom. So again, that's a very impressively light and small lens that Sony have managed to create. And again, it's a G lens. So that is going to be fully featured. Now, Sony do have um, an APS lens that is quite close to this one. It's the 1018. Um, now, a lot of people who already own the 1018 will be wanting me to say, is it worth the upgrade? Certainly, it's smaller and lighter. It's only 20% lighter than that 1018. And of course, we have a slightly bigger zoom range going up to 20 mil from that 18 mil. 
Now this one will be a, a harder decision for people who already own the 1018 to make because as I will showcase is the, um, the 1018 is actually one of Sony's impressive APS-C lenses. Now the form factor of this uh, zoom is going to be um, very small on an APS-C lens but I'm sure some Alpha 7 IV users uh, will be also interested in this uh, lens. If they're shooting in APS-C mode on their Alpha 7 IV in active steady shot with a high frame rate, this lens is going to fit the bill nicely even on a full frame camera. So I've taken these images from the uh, Sony press release here and you can see that they're quite keen to position this lens on a range of E-mount cameras from the ZV-E10 in the top left to um, one of their premium APS-C cameras bottom left on a gimbal uh, also to a full frame and I, I dare say that will be the Alpha 7.4 camera uh, shooting in the APS-C mode or Super 35 mode there so uh, I think this is going this is going to be a lens that finds a home on multiple cameras both APS-C and full frame. Quality wise let's take a look at this now uh, this is where you probably want to click on the link to look at the ultra high definition examples on my Flickr Pro account. There will be a little bit of video compression at play here which will erode some of the quality. If you're not watching this uh, video on a large 4K monitor if you do have the option I would make that switch now because what you'll be seeing is a very sharp result from the 1020 zoom lens and this was captured at maximum aperture and we're showcasing corner to corner sharpness now I have uh, I'm not trying to sell these lenses so I always because uh, a lot of people say well how can we trust you Mark you are a Sony ambassador but I would like the evidence uh, for how good these lenses are uh, for you to determine yourself by looking at those ultra high definition examples uh, if I'm, I'm doing a side-by-side -side comparison here the new 1020 is on the left um, the 1018 is over there on the right now it's a close call uh, if we're trying to assess sharpness I think they're both very sharp lenses here um, I think the um, 1020 probably has a very slight edge but it is a very slight edge over that 1018 so I've got some ultra high definition examples uh, captured here uh, both at maximum aperture and also stop down here in this instance stop down to f11 so you will see um, both aperture range there if you uh, uh, look at my ultra high definition examples on my Flickr Pro account now of course a lot of people will be looking um, to acquire this 1020 lens because of the power zoom feature that 1018 is a sharp zoom lens but it doesn't have that power zoom so this is where we're moving into the hybrid or vloggers wanting that power zoom feature now um, of course um, this uh, 1020 doesn't have optical steady shot like the 1018 so it is going to find more of a home on say the ZVE 10 which has active steady shot if you may be using uh, cameras such as the Alpha 6400 you might want to put this uh, lens on a on a, on a system that has a, a gimbal uh, as such as the Ronin gimbal that you can see over there on the left why I think this um, power zoom lens is primarily designed for late model cameras such as the ZV-E10 and Alpha 7.4 is because both of these cameras have uh, eight speeds of zoom uh, both in the standby mode the recording mode and also options for using a remote now on the Alpha 6400 and 6600 cameras you only have a choice of three zooms now um, I will showcase um, me zooming this uh, lens on the Alpha 6600 because it does have a power zoom switch on the side of the lens and if you have a very light 
touch when moving that switch, you can get quite a slow zoom in and out without having the eight speeds that you could uh, program in through the camera's menus. So let's take a look at me zooming very smoothly out using the power zoom switch on uh, this lens and the Alpha 6600 camera there. Now I will post a link to some more zoom um, examples uh, in the info section below. Another question that um, hybrid shooters will often ask is how much focus breathing do we have on this particular lens? And I have to say it's minimal focus breathing. As you can see here, I'm defocusing the lens and coming back into focus and now swinging the other way. You can see the focus breathing is again very minimal on this lens. So Sony have definitely been designing this lens for hybrid or vloggers in mind. Now, a lot of uh, people who perhaps don't own that 1018 stills photographers will want to see the quality this lens can achieve. Now, this is at the 20 mil focal length, that maximum aperture, and you will be able to check out the sharpness uh, either on this video or uh, by clicking on the link in the info section below. Here's uh, another example at uh, 20 mil now stopped down to f11 getting corner to corner sharpness in this instance. Now we're um, uh, still at the 20 mil uh, f6.3 you'll notice at 20 mil we get quite a lot of depth of field so sometimes you don't need to stop down to f8 or f11 when using this lens. Now we're going to uh, zoom out to 10 millimeter and look at uh, corner to corner sharpness at f8 and uh, another one at f8 again showing corner corner sharpness now i'm processing these from raw files and i didn't have a lens profile for this lens so i'm having to do a little bit of distortion compensation manually inside of lightroom here now i won't be able to completely perfect some of the uh, distortion using that 10 mil by the time you uh, purchase this lens however i dare say lightroom will be supplying that lens profile and you can do those lens correction if you are a raw shooter. If you're a JPEG shooter just remember to switch on um, the, uh, the, uh, the lens corrections in the camera to get full correction. And here again 10 millimeters I'm now shooting into the sun so you can see how this lens performs. Stop down to f16 to look at the sun star there. Now you will find lenses perhaps with better um, uh, sun stars than this but of course there's always a compromise between sun stars and smooth out of focus bokeh and I think um, uh, Sony have focused the bokeh in this particular instance. Here's another example. You can get a little bit of flare kicking off when you're shooting in into the sun so you sometimes you just have to reposition the uh, camera lens uh, combo here in order to minimize uh, the flare but as you can see from these two examples it is possible to minimize flare when using uh, this uh, lens now one of the interesting things about the 1018 is a lot of people noticed you could shoot in APS-C mode on a full frame camera but you could leave it in full frame mode and actually use this camera between 12 and 16 millimeters on the 1018 lens without incurring any um, uh, uh, corner shading. Now of course this isn't ideal for many users because the uh, corner sharpness at say 12 millimeters in full frame was not fabulous it has to be said. Uh, because we don't have that option on the new 1020 even at that 12 mil you are going to get some corner shading so you sort of are committed to shooting in APS-C mode if you put this uh, zoom lens onto a full frame camera. I'm now I'm zooming in and you, it's going to be a close call again in uh, absolute detail here they're very very close in sharpness when shooting stills here between that 1020 and the older 1018 lens. So let's take a look at uh, the two fast primes. So the first thing I'm going to do is just show you how um, uh, large or small they are compared to another very popular APS-C prime and that is Sony's E50mm f1.8 which is a quite a respectable uh, prime lens on their APS-C system and you can see the 11mm is smaller and the 15mm f1.4 is just a little bit larger. 
If we take a look at um, in comparison to Sony's 1655 f 2.8G, now this is a, a very a well respected zoom lens. It is a very sharp zoom lens. So some people will be going, so uh, I'm trying to choose whether to have prime lenses or that uh, 2.8G uh, zoom. So here you're seeing the, uh, the size and weight saving of maybe acquiring that 15 millimeter uh, prime lens and of course if you uh, acquire the 15 mil you'll probably also be interested in acquiring that 11 mil so some people will want to work with two primes some people will want to work with that 1655 zoom now, um, so some of the very wide aperture um, uh, prime lenses that have been very popular for APS-C shooters are Sigma's um, 3 f1.4 lenses. Now, it has to be said that their 30mm and 56mm lenses are impressively light and small lenses. Now, if we take a look at their 16mm f1.4 on the left, that is significantly larger and heavier than the other to f1.4 lenses. So this is I think where uh, Sony have been quite clever here and they've targeted this particular focal length with this particular aperture because if we take a look at that weight it's um, the weight of that Sigma 16mm uh, is getting up into that uh, full frame weight and size um, um, uh, lens there. So if we take a look at uh, Sony's 15mm f1.4, so it has a wider angle of view. It has the same wide f1.4 aperture, but it also has the aperture ring, the AF-MF switch, see the uh, custom button on the side of the link. So it has all of the bells and whistles, but it is getting in for close to half the weight of that Sigma 16mm f1.4 lens. So when um, the total weight of your camera system is very important to you. Some people might be moving over to acquiring this Sony 15mm f1.4 lens. I've listed here the most popular primes and zoom lenses and how the three new Sony lenses fit in on the weight scale here. Now the lightest are at the top and the heaviest at the bottom. And you can see the new, three new lenses, they've risen right to the top. Only Samyang AF 12 millimeter autofocus lens lens enters that top four there, so we can see um, the uh, Tamron 11/20 f 2.8 zoom and the Sigma 16 millimeter f 1.4 prime are the heaviest of those uh, options there, right at the bottom. So let's take a look at zooms now. Uh, the Tamron is uh, quite a heavier, larger lens, but of course it does have that f 2.8 aperture, which is one of the reasons that it has uh, stacked on a little bit of weight. But of course a lot of people will be more interested in that power zoom feature and of course a lot of people who want to put this um, uh, lens with, on a camera on a gimbal will also appreciate the lighter weight. So I, again it probably comes down do you want the wider aperture, the f2.8 ap aperture of that Tamron or do you want that power zoom feature of Sony's uh, 1020. Now, uh, of course, that uh, 1020 does have all of the bells and whistles. It has the AF-MF switch. It has the custom button. It has, has the power zoom. Now, I have to say that AF-MF switch is quite low on the side of the lens because it is such a small lens. I, I find myself hunting around for that AF-MF switch uh, quite a few times because it's, it's almost underneath the lens. But, of course, once you've um, got accustomed to a um, uh, making that switch you will find it quite easily. It does have that uh, focus hole button which you can assign to a custom button and it does have that power zoom switch there. Uh, just a light press will have you zooming incredibly slowly and of course a more forceful uh, press of the uh, wide tele power zoom switch will have you zooming very quickly. So it is a, a variable uh, speed uh, uh, switch there.
Now let's move over to the ultra wide angle lenses. There's three that I would prioritize here. Of course, uh, Sony's 11 millimeter f 1.8 is the uh, is the lightest and smallest. We do have a Samyang 12 millimeter f 2. It's uh, not quite as wide and it's a third of a stop uh, less wide than Sony's new 11 millimeter f 1.8. I think Sony quite a well aware of what else is on the market here. They've quite cleverly gone slightly wider with a slightly wider aperture and of course we do have a, a Zeiss which is a little bit more of an expensive offering but of course it does have good performance but it, it only has an f2.8 aperture and it is quite a lot heavier uh, than Sony's new uh, ultra wide angle 11 millimeter lens Let's take a look at the ultra wide aperture lens. Of course, this is where Sony have uh, really uh, showed how to make a light lens. Now, uh, we've got a fully featured Sony lens, which is uh, getting on for clo uh, close to 50% of the weight or half of the weight of that Sigma 16 millimeter f 1.4. And it's not giving anything away on the aperture uh, on this particular instance. Of course, and again, it's a fully featured lens. It does have the AF-MF switch, the custom button, the aperture ring, which we can de-click. And of course, we have that de-click switch. So it is going to be a popular lens for uh, videographers as well. Now, of course, I do um, like uh, wide aperture primes. Uh, I will always favor a wide aperture prime over uh, a zoom when I have the option for my own personal workflows. So I was very uh, pleased to see these uh, wide aperture primes that I could uh, uh, test on the Alpha 6600 camera. I've been flying a bit of a flag for uh, the, the premium APS-C cameras, and I have been wanting uh, a more premium APS-C camera to be developed by Sony so I hope this is uh, a sign of things to come let's take a look at maybe a 2.8 aperture this is the sort of thing that you might be shooting with the 1655 zoom lens this was actually shot on the uh, the prime lens here at 2.8 so I just wanted to show you what happens when I open up two uh, full apertures to f 1.4 now this is a picture of Mark that I chatted with on the street he's uh, found himself homeless uh, just a, a word if I ever do uh, photograph uh, uh, somebody who is homeless I do spend a good period of time chatting to them and often I help them out uh, with a night's accommodation in a hostel where I can and I would encourage encourage you to do the same. I don't tend to shoot these characters from the other side of the street using long telephoto lenses. I do uh, need to uh, find their story and, and uh, spend a good time listening to their story about how they became homeless and then try and help them out. So here we are moving uh, two stops wider. You can see how the background now completely defocuses. Um, I'm still at that same uh, distance here, but I've just opened two stops wider. So it is a, a very good way of defocusing. And of course, when we're working with wide angle lenses that tend to have a little bit more depth of field than a standard focal length lens, that very wide aperture is very important if you're wanting to create that figure ground separation or that background bokeh. Now, of course, if you are using this um, a lens to defocus the background, you are going to be using that f1.4 aperture. So this is where that one four thousandth of a second uh, shutter speed will raise its head because that is the shortest shutter speed we can use. But in a very sunny condition, that will lead to overexpose exposure. Those white clouds in the background would overexpose if I didn't come out of ISO auto and go in and select ISO 50. This is the only way I can prevent overexposure. So having a, a faster shutter speed on a new Sony APS-C camera of one eight thousandth of a second will allow us to use those f 1.4 apertures without having to come out of ISO auto. So that is why that was on that uh, wish list of that eight, uh, that awesome eight that I really wanted to see on a new APS-C camera.
Of course, uh, once you once you know that you can uh, pull good exposures just using that ISO 50 when using maximum aperture on sunny conditions. As soon as the uh, sun is not out anymore, that is a non-issue uh, because we can go back into ISO auto in those instances. And of course, we're looking at this image at captured at maximum 1.4 aperture. And if we don't have an immediate foreground, you'll find that um, pretty much everything is sharp if you're at a reasonable distance from the nearest thing in the frame. What I'm going to show you now is why some of those wide apertures are very important. OK, so this is a 10 second exposure. Obviously, the camera uh, is on a tripod now I'm shooting 10 seconds we're a long way before sunrise here and so those two brightest um, fixtures in the sky there are actually Venus and Jupiter looking towards uh, where the Sun will rise uh, probably in uh, five or ten minutes time and of course, uh, if I'm in uh, very dark alleyways in the Melbourne CBD, the Central Business District, there's not a lot of light that gets into these alleyways. So that f1.4 aperture is really useful. You can see the shutter speed has sunk to 1 1 25th of a second. So I'm obviously not going to put the camera on a tripod now. I really want to be able to shoot handheld uh, without having to um, uh, put the camera on a tripod. And of course, this is very important if uh, people are going to appear in these alleyways for street photography, I do want those uh, slightly faster shutter speeds. So the uh, tripod is not really an option in those instances. Here is a pre-dawn event. This is a Anzac Day, which is a Remembrance Day in Australia. And uh, what we're doing now is we're shooting. Uh, it's a long way from dawn now, so the only lights uh, available are the artificial lights uh, uh, lighting up the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne here. So I'm at a 1 30th of a second so handheld again the ISO has risen to uh, 3200 so it's it's pretty much a dead of night shot here now I'm showing the flames on the left because the next couple of frames that are going to make an appearance uh, well after this shot will is going to be by firelight so again, this is a 1 30th of a second, a little bit brighter ambient light now, so ISO 320. Now we're moving to a long exposure, but handheld portrait. This is a quarter of a second. Now there's no uh, optical steady shot in the lens, so this lens is primarily suited to the Alpha 6500 and the Alpha 6600 that does have steady shot inside. So that is uh, possibly something uh, that you want to be wary of if maybe you're an Alpha 6300 or 6400 shooter uh, this lens doesn't have the uh, steady shot inside the lens but I this is not really that much of an issue if you do have the in-body image stabilization because that is doing the bulk of the work in this instance and I am hand holding a quarter of a second in this very low light here's another shot this time slightly faster 1 15th of a second this uh, you could possibly hand hold on the 6300 or 6400 cameras. These are all lit by the eternal flame that you can see, which is just slightly out of frame uh, to the right of these portrait shots. Still a long way from um, the sun rising. This is at the dawn service, which starts well before dawn. This is um, in the first light. Again, the sun still hasn't risen, but now working with the maximum f1.4 aperture, comfortably hand holding a 15th of a second, and the ISO has dipped now to the base level ISO 100. So I'm getting exceptional performance even on an APS C camera in low ambient light. Uh, as the uh, dawn service finishes, I'm walking into the Shrine of Remembrance. It's a very dark interior, but I'm hand holding 1 60th of a second at f1.4. Also getting that figure ground separation. So the soldier behind the uh, uh, soldier in the immediate foreground is... Um, is uh, uh, suitably out of focus. So we're pulling attention onto that uh, shrine guard in the foreground there. Okay, so this uh, is one of the uh, returned soldiers here is, um, is a little bit emotional uh, and I am getting that figure ground separation just go by going a little bit closer and using maximum aperture. I am getting that figure ground separation. He's standing quite close to one of the pillars in the background, but you can see I'm getting uh, defocus. You can also see his sleeve uh, uh, on his raised um, right hand there is also out of focus. So we're pulling attention 
right on to his eyes in this particular portrait. Stopping down a little bit 2 uh, to 2.8 because there's a little bit of depth here in the foreground but again getting a little bit of figure ground separation uh, in the distant uh, city in the background there. If you don't have any immediate foreground at 2.8 you'll often find that this particular focal length you'll get corner to corner sharpness even at uh, f2.8 again if you're not up and close and personal to your immediate foreground subject there. Now I'm doing, uh, there was a little bit of a demonstration happening in the CBD as I uh, went in and I stopped down to f5.6 and you can see I'm quite close to these people marching past in the foreground but if we go right back to that uh, cathedral spire in the centre of the image right in the background we've got uh, sharpness going right from foreground right to background just at f5.6 aperture there. If uh, the, the camera is very low uh, to the ground, and I often use uh, well, you know, very, very short uh, tripods here, so the camera will be almost uh, on the wet sand in, in, that you can see in the foreground, I will stop down to f11. So I just go and get corner to corner sharpness here. Uh, again, I could probably shoot this handheld. Uh, I would just put the camera really close to the sand in this particular instance. Um, often when I am doing these type of f11 shots I'll use the hyperfocal distance rather than use autofocus and I'm just pushing in there if I would um, manually focus to 3 meters if using the hyperfocal distance at f11 on this 15 millimeter prime lens. Now a lot of people will say okay so we've got two wide aperture primes here so how would you decide whether to go for the 15mm f1.4 or the 11mm f1.8 so I'm going to showcase this now so to help you make that decision. Now of course some people who are not wanting to buy the 1655 2.8G may uh, end up buying both of these uh, so you've got that um, significant difference. Now 11 and 15mm doesn't sound hugely different but it is an, a very different angle of view at this ultra wide angle. So let's take a look at the 15mm. I'm trying to get some uh, converging verticals here so you can see how much steeper the perspective is when we switch over to 11mm. So it's not close you can see we get a much wider angle of view much steeper perspective. Now I often don't uh, tilt the camera lens combination up to get these converging verticals when dealing with architecture this is really just used for demonstration purposes so you can see the significance difference between 15 and 11 millimeters here again at 15 millimeters and the much steeper perspective at 11 millimeters um, okay so you can see uh, a significant difference between these two focal lengths so steep perspective when we're not tilting up obviously the 11 millimeter has the converging verticals but it creates this very dramatic landscape yes you do have to get up close to something in the foreground to get this to work on the 11 millimeter focal length but once you know how to do that you can create these very dramatic urban and natural landscapes in a natural landscape you would just position maybe a, a river or a, a fence line into that foreground so again you can and really milk that uh, steep perspective from that 11 mil focal length. If you are using these ultra wide angle primes you will want to go and go to your lens compensation and switch uh, those to auto uh, if you're a JPEG shooter. If you're a RAW shooter you are going to have to apply the lens profile in your post-production software. Now because these were pre-production lenses there was no lens profile available so you can see that there was distortion and is often referred to as barrel distortion. Now when once corrected you do still get corner to corner sharpness but you do need to correct that distortion either manually or using the lens profile. So you can see the curvature both on the 11 and 15 millimeter from that straight bottoms step there. So you will find um, uh, straight lines 
curving especially towards the edge of the frame on both the 11 and 15 millimeter if uncorrected so as you can see here I am doing that manual correction normally I would just pick up the profile but I'm just going into lens corrections manual and then using that distortion slider and rolling it to the 40 to 50 position until my um, straight lines are basically straight Okay, so let's um, take a look at that 11 millimeter focal length now. Um, this was has, has to be one of my favorite focal lengths for APS-C uh, system. So much so that um, because of the absence of uh, this Sony 11 millimeter prime, I was actually using a Samyang Rokinon 12 millimeter manual focus f2 this was uh, really needed if i was doing um, some uh, low light ambient shots and so uh, samyang and rockinon also now have an af version of this particular lens and the AF version is actually lighter than the manual focus but not as light as the sony's new 11 millimeter so here is Sony's 11mm f1.8 20 second exposure and this is of course is one of the reasons you would want that ultra wide aperture you don't really want to be using an f4 lens to be shooting astro on an APS-C camera so keeping the ISO down to, um, really low and using those long exposures is really quite important uh, when using APS-C format now this is just um, uh, a side by side comparison if you own the older manual focus Rokinon or Samyang versions of this you'll see that it is uh, appreciably a smaller lens this time from a top down view of that. So let's take a look at um, that uh, 11 millimeter f1.8 in a landscape, a natural landscape setting here now. So I'm on a, a beach uh, on Stradbroke Island uh, off the east coast of Australia. It's called Dead Man's Beach beautiful beach with a lot of foreground information for me to weave into the compositions here. Now it's got a 16.5 millimeter full frame equivalent angle of view. So that is uh, obviously quite as wide as many people go on their full frame camera systems. So we can now match that with this 11 millimeter prime. You could use that 1020 zoom, but again, I do like the primes in these instances for the small form factor, for the wider aperture. Now, even just standing on my balcony on Stradbroke Island, you can see the steep perspective and from that angle of view that we're, we're pulling there. Okay, so this is obviously stopped down to f8, so I can get corner to corner sharpness. But in a dark alleyway, even at maximum aperture, you'd be surprised how much um, sharpness you get even at maximum aperture. So long as you don't get too close to your foreground subject, you can pull quite significant uh, depth of field. You might not have absolute um, corner sharpness if you're zooming in to the full resolution file, but if you're, if you're just looking at the 4K fit on screen view, you will get the perception of um, corner to corner sharpness. Here again at f1.8, I'm um, quite close to the corner of that building as it comes quite close to the lens. But even stretching back to the guy doing the selfie in the background, this is a place called ACDC Lane after the ACDC rock band here. And um, uh, we're seeing that we've got more than acceptable sharpness on that guy doing the selfie in the background there. You can get figure ground separation on this little 11 millimeter at maximum aperture, but you have to be really up close and personal to something in the foreground to defocus the background. But here I'm showing casing that. If we just stop down to something like f5.6, even when I'm really close to something in the foreground, you can get a, a depth of field extending from right close right through to the horizon line. Uh, stopping down because I'm even closer to that handrail I could probably out, uh, stretch my left hand out and touch that handrail uh, on the side there so I'm stopping down to f8 to get that corner sharpness here okay so f8 again you'll see shooting into the sun here at f8 but really even uh, stopping down to 7 Point one, we're not getting anything magical happening with that sun on the 11 millimeter prime. We've really got to stop down to uh, beyond f11 to start uh, pulling those sun stars. 
Again, um, uh, there you might find a little bit of flare, but nothing uh, too major here. So you can shoot into the sun, which obviously is quite important for a landscape lens. And again, F16 shooting into the sun just to showcase that uh, sun star here. So we're getting a uh, go right down close now to the foreground um, information here. Now here's uh, an image uh, captured with a long exposure, 25 seconds at f8 on dead man's beach so um, we'll take a look at uh, hyperfocal distance because often in these instances i'll switch um, the switch on the lens the afmf switch to mf and i'll just dial in two meters uh, when i've um, pulled in, uh, in the aperture down to f8 this um, in most instances will give me the depth of field i require unless i get even closer to that foreground now, having uh, using the hyperfocal distance in manual focus rather than autofocus can be very helpful when obviously there's a wave washing over the foreground rocks, and of course that would confuse the autofocus system. So just dialing in two meters—that's approximately six feet from the front of the lens—is uh, is probably a more efficient way uh, to find focus when using this in a landscape setting. Okay, F8 again, you will find a little bit of softness in that bottom left hand corner there. That is because it is very, very close. Uh, to give you an idea of how close that is, I'm going to show you the size of the tripod I'm using. And I'll often uh, splay the legs out so it is exceptionally close um, to the um, surface of the rocks that I'm photographing in the foreground. And this is why I would stop down to F11 in these instances. So that showcases the height of the camera on these long exposures. So you can see why that foreground is so close to the camera lens combination and why F11 at two meters is required. Now using hyperfocal distance, you could possibly focus at one and a half meters, except the camera just uh, switches between one, two and three in whole uh, meter increments. You don't get the option to choose 1.5 meters if you were dialing in hyperfocal distance. OK, so that is just one of the um, scenarios about using uh, manual focus on these lenses. So quite a few examples captured at f11 because of my proximity proximity to the foreground subject matter there. And so this is uh, just zooming into 100% showing why I need that f11 aperture in these instances. Now there is um, uh, the uh, the Zeiss Batis lens does have a, um, uh, an LED uh, readout on the barrel of the lens. So you can manually choose the precise hyperfocal distance that you need to dial in. It would be nice if um, Sony uh, borrowed something from the Zeiss design because I find that's a very useful feature. Unfortunately it's not available on their Tuit lens which is their APS-C design lens so you really have to go full frame to find that uh, feature um, which is uh, why I do like that 18mm um, Batis lens as well as Sony's excellent FE 20mm uh, full frame lens. Occasionally I will stop down to f16, but of course you will start moving into the uh, the realm of diffraction on an APS-C camera when moving into these very small apertures. And f22 is really never really required when using um, uh, APS-C cameras because of their inherent uh, increased uh, depth of field over full frame. So there is if you did stop down, um, you could possibly bring the focus distance to one meter if um, uh, stopping down to f16 if you needed to do that. Okay, long exposure noise reduction. Now when you use long exposure noise reduction, um, there is a manual technique called dark frame subtraction, but it is quite long winded and you have to do it in Photoshop and not Lightroom. So most people are advised when doing long exposures, especially over 10 seconds, to have a long exposure noise reduction switched on. It will kick in on exposures longer than one second if you enable it. But what happens when you do this one APS-C cameras it will lower the bit depth from 14 uh, to 12 bits with noise reduction enabled. 
OK, so there's the long exposure noise reduction setting switched on. And I do recommend this if you are doing exposures longer than 10 seconds on APS-C cameras. So this is uh, brings me to why I want some of the new features on a premium APS-C camera, because um, the, this raw images are recorded in the compressed raw format. We don't get an option for shooting in uncompressed raw like we do on all of the modern uh, full frame alpha cameras. We also, if we read the manual carefully, we also read that raw images have a resolution of 14 bits per pi uh, pixel, but are limited to 12 bits in the following shooting modes. And these include long exposure noise reduction, starting at one second, bulb, those are for exposures longer than 30 seconds, continuous shooting and silent shooting. Now, if you look at compare that to a modern full frame camera like the Alpha 7 IV, it is only limited to 12 bits when shooting continuous shooting when the file format is set to compressed RAW. And we do have options for lossless compression and uncompressed to go back to shooting 14 bits. Now, one of the other things that we will note when we look at um, comparing Sony's APS-C sensors to their full-frame sensors, remember those full-frame sensors are backlit illuminated sensors, they're a newer generation of sensor, is they do have a two-thirds of a stop increased dynamic range compared to a camera such as the Alpha 6600 or 6400. So this is certainly something that might be important for for landscape shooters. So in this particular instance, I had to bracket my exposures. I bracketed three shots, two stops apart, and then I did this manually inside of Photoshop. I, I um, had the best of the shadows from the lighter image and the best of the highlights from the darker image. This is possibly something I would not needed to have done on a full frame camera. So there are workarounds if you are using an APS-C camera, but I would like like a newer APS-C camera to start giving me these 14-bit uncompressed RAW options. So this is what the file looks like inside of uh, Lightroom uh, CC um, without any editing. So um, there's no lossy uh, compre uh, compression or uncompressed RAW options. So this is compressed and because of the long exposures it's also 12 bit. Now they will withstand quite a lot of editing before you find the file starting to fall apart. Because this wasn't an, um, a really extreme subject brightness range I've managed to do some very um, uh, well quite a lot of editing. You can see the highlights and shadows are pushed to their maximum here as well as adding contrast and exposure adjustments. Now you have to be very careful to monitor the shadows because you could invoke some stepping or banding if we lighten those shadows too much on an, on a compressed raw file format shooting in 12 bits. I've managed to get away with it here and if you look at the ultra high definition examples you'll see that they're, they're really high quality but I'm just uh, alerting you to the fact why some people do choose full frame over APS-C. So just a reminder uh, not everybody is a vlogger so a, lo a lot of people will want these uh, lenses for vlogging but there will be some APS-C um, stills photographers who will um, want these new lenses but will also want to use these lenses on a new uh, premium APS-C camera so all I'm saying here is roll on the Alpha 6800 or uh, Alpha 7000 series camera and of course, one of the things that, uh, or sort of four of these uh, um, features that I have um, said would I would welcome, uh, would have been welcome in this particular review, and that is the backlit illuminated sensor, sensor option for uncompressed or lossless compressed RAW, 14-bit RAW when shooting with long exposure noise reduction on, and bulb mode, faster shutter speed when shooting with uh, one eight thousandth of a second when using the f1.4 uh, in sunny weather. 
OK, so I'd also like Sony just to uh, throw out uh, a loyalty for, for their APS-C customers who have stuck with their APS-C system over the last three years and to throw out um, an Alpha 6000 series firmware update which will bring them uh, the option for a uh, change of focus frame colour and also support for the smallest uh, HVL F28 RM flash unit which currently isn't supported by the Alpha 6400 and 6600 camera. Um, it is supported by the ZVE10 which uh, for those vloggers they're less likely to use uh, the flash but uh, I would like to see those um, rolled out over future firmware updates. Now if you're looking for more support as a Sony photographer you could head over to patreon.com forward slash Mark Gaylor. If you subscribe to my site you will be able to download a four or five hundred page ebook for your camera. Now I have other learning resources you can access, access as well including the very active Q&A forums. I have over 20 hours of member only seminars for you to watch and I also have cam set files for four of the latest model cameras. This is where I can set up your complete camera from a file copied to a memory card and I also supply raw files for new lens reviews and new cameras so there's a lot to be had there. If you subscribe for just one month there's no ongoing contracts or further commitments so you can get the support you, you need. Hopefully you've enjoyed watching this uh, lens review video tutorial. If you have, please hit the subscribe button below the movie and uh, also check out the info section below the video. You will find a link to my Flickr Pro account where you can see the ultra high definition examples that I've been shooting with these three lenses. And of course that is the ultimate test for sharpness is not what I say about the lenses but what you can see on a very large 4K monitor. Okay, I'll catch up with you next time. I'm Mark Gaylor, Sony Imaging Ambassador.